Welcome everyone to the fourth and final section of our first QA Forum of 2025. I'm Dr. Michael Novick, the Director of Education and Associate Director of Quality Assurance for VRAD. Today we'll be discussing some vascular cases from our archives. Here is our accreditation statement, and here are the learning objectives for this lecture. Our first patient is a 59-year-old woman with sudden onset severe back and chest pain. We'll begin with the non-contrast axial images from a CT angiogram of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And here are the post-contrast arterial phase axial images. The coronal reformatted post contrast images. And the sagittal reformatted post contrast images. Let's return to this non-contrast axial image to review the findings. There is aneurysmal dilatation of the ascending thoracic aorta. And the descending thoracic aorta at approximately the level of the hiatus. There is displaced intimal calcium in the descending thoracic aorta. Which you can see is associated with a dissection flap on the arterial phase images. Posteriorly, we have the true lumen of the dissection and anteriorly the false lumen. As the dissection begins just distal to the origin of the left subclavian artery, this is a Stanford type B dissection. This non-contrast axial image at the level of the descending abdominal aorta reveals another focus of displaced intimal calcium which is again visible in association with the dissection flap on the post-contrast images. Here again, we can see the true lumen of the dissection. At this level, it is on the left posterolateral aspect of the aorta, with the false lumen being slightly less opacified along the right anterolateral aspect of the aorta. Another axial slice at the level of the kidneys reveals asymmetric hypoattenuation or hypoenhancement of the right kidney relative to the left. On this coronal image, the differential enhancement of the kidneys should be clear. Following the right renal artery back to its origin, we can see that it originates from the false lumen of the aortic dissection.
which accounts for the hypoperfusion of the right kidney. But we aren't done yet, even more inferiorly at the level of the common iliac arteries. There is asymmetric hypoattenuation or hypoenhancement of the left common iliac artery, consistent with near occlusion. This coronal arterial phase image nicely demonstrates the trickle of flow in this vessel. But we still aren't done. I hope some of you noticed at approximately the level of the right atrium there is an abnormality. This appearance is due to marked dilatation of the sinus of Valsalva. So in addition to the Stanford type B aortic dissection, the near occlusion of the left common iliac artery, and the hypoperfusion of the right kidney, this patient is also suffering from a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm. Let's briefly discuss sinus of Valsalva aneurysms. They are more commonly seen in men by an approximately 3 or 4 to 1 ratio. They can be either congenital in association with Marfan syndrome, collagen vascular disease, and vasculitides, or acquired, secondary to infection, atherosclerotic disease, trauma, and iatrogenic causes. Sinus of Valsalva aneurysms are associated with and can cause thoracic aortic aneurysms, and they commonly occur with other congenital heart anomalies, including ventricular septal defect, bicuspid aortic valve, and pulmonic stenosis. Common presenting symptoms include dyspnea, chest pain, palpitations, cardiac murmurs, and in the worst case scenario, rupture. Other complications include ventricular outflow tract obstruction, aortic regurgitation, myocardial infarction, and cardiac arrhythmias. If you're so inclined, here is another suggestion for your summer reading list. Our next patient is a 67-year-old woman with new-onset headache. These are the axial images from a CT scan of the head. followed by the axial images from a contrast-enhanced CT angiogram of the head. The coronal images from that study And finally, the sagittal images. Returning to one of the non-contrast axial images, there is faint hyperattenuation in the right frontal white matter. On the corresponding post-contrast arterial phase axial image, there is an engorged collecting vein. With multiple small feeding veins known as caput medusae, Moving on to this coronal image, 
we can again see the engorged collecting vein with multiple small feeding veins. On this sagittal image, we're catching the engorged collecting vein on FOSS. with multiple small surrounding tributaries. Our diagnosis in this case is a developmental venous anomaly, or DVA, one of the many intracranial vascular malformations. Let's first briefly discuss DVAs, which account for approximately 50% of all cerebral vascular malformations are characterized, as we saw, by the caput medusae or palm tree sign. They are usually solitary, except in the case of blue rubber bleb nevis syndrome, which of course we've all seen hundreds of times in our careers. They are usually asymptomatic, but can present with intracranial bleeds. And they are most commonly seen in the frontoparietal region, as in this case, and the cerebellum. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I wanted to do a quick review of cerebral vascular malformations in general. These can be classified as high or low flow by the presence or absence of arteriovenous shunting, histomorphology, and by age or other demographics. Some of the more common malformations we see are arteriovenous malformations, which are high flow lesions, dural arteriovenous fistulae, which include vein of Galen aneurysms, these are also high flow lesions, cavernous malformations or cavernomas, which are considered low flow lesions, and as we saw, the most common of the cerebral vascular malformations, the developmental venous anomaly. You can read about these and the various other types of cerebral vascular malformations in this excellent reference article. Our next patient is a 47-year-old woman with hematochesia. These are axial images from a contrast-enhanced CT angiogram of the abdomen and pelvis. And here are the sagittal images from the same study. Let's cone down on a couple of the sagittal images from this examination. There is high-grade stenosis at the origin of the celiac artery. With a similar appearance at the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. I'll ask you to trust me that the inferior mesenteric artery was similarly narrowed. I hope I can convince you that there is some mild small bowel wall thickening on this axial image at the level of the pelvis. which in concert with the mesenteric arterial findings raises concern for developing intestinal ischemia. Our final patient is a 51-year-old woman with worsening dyspnea. These are axial images from a contrast-enhanced CT angiogram of the chest.
The first thing I'd like to point out is that there is suboptimal enhancement of the pulmonary arteries. Here you can see the mean Hounsfield units of 107. We should be at 200 or above for an optimal study. But in spite of the study limitations, we can still identify intraluminal hypoattenuation in a branch of the left upper lobe pulmonary artery. which is of course consistent with a pulmonary embolism. I wanted to show this relatively simple case to remind everybody that even when the study is limited or there is motion artifact or streak artifact or suboptimal contrast enhancement or any of the various artifacts that we see on MRI, we can often make a diagnosis despite the artifact and the study limitation. So it's always important to go through your search pattern completely, even in cases where the examination is limited. Thank you so much again for joining me. I will see you next time with our second QA forum of 2025. Take care.